Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, especially to our guest discussants today. I'd like to first acknowledge, of course, uh, my colleagues, um, Anarita Vargas, uh, Madeline Luis uh, Baino, and Bless Mendez for, for the hard work they put uh, uh, in this study with me. So um, this study that we did last year was motivated, uh, of course, as, as mentioned by uh, Dr. Uh, Arbeta, it was motivated by the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic where hundreds of thousands of our migrant workers suddenly came home uh, because their works have been adversely affected. Even those working as professionals uh, or highly skilled workers uh, found themselves suddenly um, negatively affected by, by the pandemic. So the question in my mind then was that given such uh, effects and the magnitude of those adversely affected. My question was, did our OFWs gain access to social protection like, for instance, um, coverage in our public insurance programs uh, or even private insurance schemes? So this uh, which can help them uh, cope you know, in times of crisis like this. So I think it was really important to look uh, into this uh, matter. And also, uh, given that OFWs gain some financial capacity you know, when, when they go to work abroad, I feel that uh, they should take advantage of it and invest in their health and in their future, uh, get themselves a good pension plan. So, and sometimes, you know, overseas uh, work um, has serious or a serious social consequences. I myself um, came from a family of OFWs and um, it can have adverse consequences to families and marriages and to the welfare of children because of long separation. So I really think that the opportunities provided by overseas work must be maximized. So that was the, the rational for looking into social protection. And fortunately, we have uh, a recent national survey that we can use, which is the National Migration Survey. And this was carried out in 2018, uh, which is the pre-pandemic period. And so because of this, we thought that an analysis of the NMS would be useful, uh, also given the, the problems and the difficulties in conducting primary data collection. Next slide, please. Can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So I'm, I'm just showing, I want to show you the outline of my presentation. We're just going very briefly to the introduction and then we go to the characteristics of international migration phenomenon and then the migration process and experience and then to access to social protection and recommendations. So you can see I'm presenting actually two uh, papers or two studies uh, in this one uh, 30 minute presentation. Next slide. Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, so as mentioned by Dr. Herbert a while ago, we have seen, next slide, please. We have seen the largest magnitude of OFWs who have returned home since the 1970s. Uh, in fact, a total of, uh, as of November 2021, a total of 809,374. And um, in 2020, DFA assisted, uh, based on its website, they assisted 300,200 327,511 OFWs, and this pie chart shows the, the breakdown based on their um, destination, where they, they came from. So, of course, Middle East have the largest share in the repatriation uh, because of its being a top destination, and these are the corresponding percentages uh, from other parts of the world. In terms of remittances, um, we have seen uh, a performance that is better than expected. Remittances went down by 0.8% in 2020, though the forecasted um, decline, I think, was significantly higher, I think 6% by the BSP, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but in 2021, the performance of remittances uh, was uh, encouraging with a new record high. So it's likely that Many of our OFWs who have returned uh, are already going back, you know, as shown by uh, what I've seen in terms of the deployment of, of uh, 600 or 675,000 OFWs from, I think, January to November last year. Nevertheless, um, the pandemic taught us uh, the importance of having access to social protection or social insurance like, like our SSS and uh, other uh, similar schemes. Next slide, please. So 
the main policy question that we want to examine is simply how to improve migrant workers' access to social protection. So to try to answer this question, we examined, um, of course, access to social protection in terms of, of coverage. But the part of this effort is to analyze the characteristics of the migration phenomenon, you know, to, to gather stylized facts um, about OFW's experience in international migration, uh, since we already have the data and perhaps we can, we can link that to to the access uh, to social protection, and uh, and when uh, and after doing this, after analyzing uh, their characteristics, we can perhaps gain um, uh, uh, insights about gaps and on how to improve um, the social protection access of our migrant workers. Next slide, please. So these are the objectives. As I've mentioned, um, we wanted to analyze the characteristics of migrant workers and their families, their social circumstances, and their experience. We want to examine their um, access to social protection, like uh, like what is uh, available in the data, like SSS or GSIS, field health, um, even on-site protection, uh, such as uh, basic labor-based benefits and uh, health insurance. And the purpose really is to identify areas for improving migrant workers access to social protection and to draw some policy related um, insights. Next slide, please. So the data that we use, as I've mentioned, is the National Migration Survey of 2018. Um, this is the country's very first nationwide survey on migration that is really representative of this phenomenon. So it uh, aside from international migration, there are also uh, rich information on internal migration, and um, it is, uh, as I've mentioned, representative of the population of the migrant sending households uh, in the Philippines. So, as as I just want to clarify again that when I refer to social protection, it's only limited to the data that is available, of course, in the NMS, such as uh, being member or dependent of SSS, uh, GSIS, PhilHealth, uh, other private uh, insurance uh, or, or rather private health insurance uh, programs, um, and also um, because this does not. Uh, say anything about maintaining membership, I think for uh, right now, just for the purpose of this study, I think it, it, it also still provides uh, useful information. So, ano lang kasi to eh? so membership and coverage, it doesn't say anything about um, like long term maintaining your, your contributions and all that. So, however, I think it's it still provides a lot of uh, information and insights. Um, there is another caveat in using the National Migration Survey. Um, while the numbers generated by the survey are representative of the migration phenomenon, um, but with respect to the detailed characteristics, uh, for instance, their situation in terms of their of the social protection of the workers' benefits, the information came from returnees because the PSA in the NMS, um, in doing the NMS, interviewed only those who were in the country at the time of the survey. So they did, they did not interview people um, who were then working or residing abroad. I think this is because of um, logistical uh, difficulties of, of doing that. So it's important for us to, to have those in mind as we look into the data that, uh, that will be presented later. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, so let me now show you the the characteristics of the uh, migration, uh, international migration phenomenon in the country. Six uh, from the survey, six for every 100 Filipinos or 6.4% uh, of those aged 15 and above are internet, have international migration experience for at least three months. Um, that is, if you translate it into magnitude, that's 4.7 million. As a crude uh, comparison, although they're not really uh, comparable, 3.6% of the global population are considered international migrants in 2020. This is based on, on the UN migration data. So we can say that compared to the global average, we Filipinos have uh, a greater tendency for international migration. Um, the population of, of internal migrants only uh, was at uh, nearly 49% of the population of interest, while some 45% of our population have never migrated, whether internally or, 
or internationally. And when you say migration, I think the boundary, the minimum boundary here is the city or the municipality. In terms of OFWs, there were 3.58 million OFW members belonging to 3 million households. Next slide, please. As a proportion of the total households, um, those with OFW members comprise 12% of the total. So as this uh, map shows, um, uh, or this map shows the varying tendencies uh, of subnational regions for international migration. So although uh, at the national level, 12% of households have OFWs, other, like if you look at the regional um, disaggregation, um, there is this varying um, tendencies or, or capacities for international migration. So the proportion of households with OFWs um, was, was highest in 2018 in ARM with nearly 24%, so 24% nearly quarter of their households have OFW members. And this is followed by Cagayan Valley with uh, around 22%, Ilocos region with 18%, and NCR with 17%. This proportion is lowest in Caraga and in Mimaropa. And we also have obtained from the study that um, based on their mother tongue, Ilocanos, like me, have greater tendency for international migration than other groups uh, in the country because the share of population of, of international migrants um, in Ilocos is 16%, but its share in total population is only 9%. Next slide, please. Okay, so without making any attribution to international migration, majority of households with OFWs belong to those in the two highest uh, wealth quintiles. And this is based on their 28 economic uh, situation. So, and households uh, with OFWs have higher percentages of house ownership um, compared to the, the those without house, without OFWs in the household. And uh, so that's, um, they have higher uh, house ownership, 69% uh, versus 57, and they have higher um, proportion of having this asset, all, all these asset types that are shown here in this graph, except I think um, motorized boats, where in parang pareho lang sila. Next slide, please. Now let me show you the profile of Filipino international migrants based on their first international movement. So the way that this was um, operationalized, the, the survey by, by PSA is that they obtain information and then they qualify it. Uh, and uh, for this, for the data that is shown here, we are looking at the, for instance, the age of the migrant or mig international migrants uh, when they first engage in international migration. And we found here that regardless of sex, majority of international migrants are in their 20s and an overwhelming majority are in their 20s to 30s. In terms of education, compared to the general population, international migrants are relatively more educated. Let's look at the, the next slide uh, on this further. Next slide, please. Yeah, so so if you look at the two graphs here, the, the one on the left are for international migrants, um, for um, individuals 15 and above, and the, the one on the right uh, is that for the total population, including the migrants. Okay, so many international migrants um, were composed largely of, of those with at least post-secondary education. So if you add, for instance, those who were graduates of post-secondary those with some college and those who were college graduates um, in their first migration, you, you can uh, you can add up and then you can obtain 48%. Uh, but if we if you compare to the like total population, um, the percentage of that uh, of that group is only 30%. So international migrants are are more educated than the average uh, Filipino. We can we can maybe say that. Next slide, please. Okay, so yeah, if we are after the possible social implications um, to families, um, it's important to note that 47% of the international migrants were married at the time of their first uh, migration. And if we include the married uh, and the married-like status, um, they, they, they comprise 53% and 39% were single. 
And majority, uh, 63% of, the, of them, of the international migrants, had children. And among those with children, an overwhelming proportion were minors at the time of migration. Next slide, please. In terms of uh, prior work experience, 49% um, of international migrants did not have work prior to movement. And among those who had jobs, then many were in the service and sales um, work, elementary occupations, and, and craft workers. Those are the, the double digit um, proportions or share uh, in the table. However, it's interesting to know that majority of them perceived their financial situation prior to movement as sufficient, um, at least. So there were uh, some 44% who noted that their financial capacity was less than sufficient. But mas marami yung sinasabi na um, at least sufficient. And then there is some like 3% that they, who said that, they're, that they view their economic uh, capacity as, as more than sufficient. This is prior to migration. Next slide, please. On the top destinations, of course, the data is consistent with administrative records where the top destinations are the Middle East countries, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, but also, we also have significant numbers going to East Asia and Southeast Asia. And uh, from, from this table, we, from the table on the uh, left, the main reason for migration was employment. And it's an overwhelming um, evidence that um, they move uh, due to economic reasons, wherein you can see nine, almost 93% reported that they did it for economic purposes, whether it's for a job change or you want to relocate or you want to, to get um, better uh, employment. Next slide, please. Okay, so, so we know that most of our first-time migrant workers were young, educated, and driven by economic reasons, though many of them perceive that their economic situation at home was sufficient. Somehow, their occupational profile abroad seems to point out that many were willing to take on jobs that are not commensurate with their educational attainment. So if you look into this table, it shows the distribution of workers with and without higher education. We can see that a large proportion of those with higher education are in elementary occupations and in service and, and sales works. Of course, the proportion of, of such um, elementary uh, occupation workers among those without higher education was, was very high at 47%, but, but that was expected. So perhaps it's, it's important to keep in mind um, the, as we discuss later, you know, the, the access to social protection, that many are young and so maybe their idea of, of pension uh, during the time was very far off. Um, though they are educated, the jobs that many of them get are not commensurate to their educational attainment. Um, so that says a lot about their ability to, to, to pay for their premiums. And so maybe they, they'd rather not, not uh, be covered by, by insurance uh, programs. But, you know, the, the, the kind of jobs that they get abroad, of course, is also uh, partly due to the types of work that's, that is in demand um, or which are, which are available abroad. So perhaps these factors, you know, contribute to their um, ability or, or inability or lack of willingness to consider uh, social protection access. And um, many of them seem to, to have come from families that are not really, you know, the poorest of the poor, you know, based on their pre-migration perception, which, which is it, which is consistent with with theory um, in international migration that because it's costly, so it's really not the poorest of the poor who are able to go to go abroad, and perhaps uh, also the this this finding you know, help help us in terms of 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 uh, understanding or ma making sense uh, of of their views on social social insurance and social protection. Next slide, please. So let's now go to migration process. And um, this is very important. Now we, we include this part because there, of course there is information uh, about it from the survey. And so we thought it might be useful to, to include it in our, in our analysis. And it turned out uh, very useful uh, indeed. Um, let's start with financing. Next slide, please. So most international migrants finance their move um, through financial support from family. So nearly 40% um, ang nagagaling sa family nila. And also 25% came from their um, 
uh, own funds um, or 25 percent of them said that, that it came from their own funds which to me says a lot about you know the strong tendency of people to to rely on their own families um, in times of need and the other sources of financing uh, that was shown here um, were the employer and borrowings from family and friends um, only a very small percentage took in loans uh, for them to to finance their migration next slide please Uh, next slide, please. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? On the types of visa used uh, by entry. Yeah, so if, if you look at the types of visa used um, um, for entry, oh, sorry, can you go, please? one slide uh, back yeah so if we look at the types of visa used for entry by migrant workers um 78 percent of them used a uh, work visa or work permit some 11 percent used tourist visa um, and others use other types um some three percent i think did not need visa to to enter the country and there is some eight percent or around three hundred three thousand uh, of them uh, working uh, who change their visa while they're uh, at the destination. So mostly um, when they change their visa, um, they, the, the visa became a work visa or, or a work permit. Next slide, please. Now we move to the common, uh, to the recruitment mechanism. The most common recruitment mechanism is through private um, recruitment agency. 59% um, followed by uh, direct hiring by employers um, at 34%. So in terms of communication methods in the recruitment process, the dominant method uh, was face-to-face -face, uh, or work uh, walk-ins as shown by 46% by uh, who responded that they used this communication method. Next slide, please. There is a non-negligible proportion um, of of migrant workers, um, that's 12.6% or nearly a half a million, uh, reported that they did not have a written contract prior to entry. And it, if you look at the profile of, of these workers, um, there is a greater tendency of being in this situation for those who had lower educational attainment, those who were directly hired by employers, and those, those who did not need visa, uh, to enter the, the host country and those who went there using tourist visa. These, of course, are, are mere correlations, but nevertheless, I think they are, they are useful in our analysis. Next slide, please. In terms of their assessment of their experience, as I've mentioned in, in, when, I, when I discussed the, the data uh, that we use, the NMS, um, we, the, the NMS or the PSA interviewed uh, uh, basically returnees, so they were able to get this information. So in terms of their assessment of their experience, around 21% of households reported that their financial situation improved. 73% or majority, uh, an overwhelming majority of them remained the same. They, they felt that their situation remained the same, while 6.4% um, said that their situation were worse off after migration. Of course, this is this is perception based um, and it's difficult to attribute the changes here uh, to international migration because um, of many other possible reasons. But somehow it helps us understand their situation, especially in the context of, of promoting um, social protection. Next slide, please. Further on their experience, um, half of the returning migrants or like 51% reported that they that they had um, experienced difficulty upon their return, and um, uh, this is mostly pertaining to the difficulty of finding a job uh, and difficulty of finding a job that corresponds to their skills. And an overwhelming proportion also noted that they did not receive any support from the government when they returned, and a sizable proportion also were not aware of migration networks organized by the government. And so um, 
it's really important to have a good discussion like on how to on how to address their needs or perhaps there is a there is a way that we can do in terms of you know uh, raising awareness on the, the the many programs that the government um, has has prepared them and so it, it's, it's really important and that, that now that we are having this uh, good discussion uh, so that we can help them build on their preparedness and and how to improve also financial literacy because basically this is this is about uh, financial literacy next slide please now we move to uh, access to social protection uh, next slide please Many migrant workers um, still lack most of the basic workplace benefits. So let's look at the first country migration data. So the, the way that the PSA um, asked this through the NMS is that they ask whether the respondent um, um, uh, or they ask the respondent if the, 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 these benefits were provided by their by their uh, employers. So the most common benefits received by OFWs in their first migration experience are those um, which um, meet rather immediate on-site needs such as housing, lodging benefits, uh, and this is followed by food allowance, rice allowance, or other, other consumer uh, product. Majority reported that their employer provided health insurance, so 53%. Uh, either they provide either health insurance or, or medical allowance as part of the benefits. But um, only half provided payment for overtime work. So yung kalahati, wala silang benefits na, na nag, nagpipay ng kanila overtime uh, work. 45% provided for compensation for work-related accidents. Um, and only 39% reported they were entitled to paid sick leave. And a smaller percentage provided paid vacation leave. Um, the other benefits that were rarely provided um, included uh, separation pay, maternity and paternity leave, and, and retirement pension. Next slide, please. Okay, so in terms of the, the membership in social insurance, such as SSS, GSIS, and field health, so the way that this was asked in the, in the survey was that if uh, at the time of, of the, the first migration, the first country uh, that was uh, visited by, by this worker, whether they have uh, membership or are they dependents in, in this uh, insurance scheme. So SSS, GSIS, field health, um, they were also asked, I think, about other uh, private uh, insurance programs. So if we look at the, the proportion of those with access to social security scheme, uh, that is SSS, GSIS, uh, we, we saw an estimate of 49%. While those with um, field health um, coverage, uh, whether being as member or as dependent, um, the estimate was 45% of the total of, of migrant workers. But, you know, the timelines here, vary so we we tried to group the migrant workers based on their first international movement so you can see the the years there the different years because uh, others uh, went in earlier others um nito lang. so we categorized them so we have seen that those who engage in overseas work in recent years have um better uh, performance so they have higher proportion there is higher proportion of them with access uh, to the said social protection schemes compared to those um, who were uh, deployed um, earlier um, nevertheless i think there is a lot of room for improvement if we are to maximize the gains from international migration especially that we found that many households were not necessarily better off after their um, migration experience next slide please so this table provides a summary of the percentages of those with access to insurance schemes, both public and, and private within the Philippines and on site. So if you look at it, 68% of the migrant workers had access to at least one health insurance, um, while 54% had at least one of these uh, insurance types. And it's important to know the, the characteristics of those without access or those who were non-members or non-dependents to any of these schemes so that we can get, uh, we can have an evidence on, on what to target in, in interventions. Next slide, please. So these figures show um, the one on the left on access to the health insurance, um, the one on the right access to 
social pension. So these figures show the positive correlation between being covered and educational attainment. As you can see, as you as you move the ladder in terms of the education, you can see that uh, there are um, those there are more of those with access to to these uh, programs. So the less educated, they are less likely to be to be covered. Next slide, please. Okay, the destinations that have the highest proportion of those without coverage or access to any of the insurance schemes that were included were Malaysia, Bahrain, and Lebanon. So you you get this figure by um, just getting the the number of of migrant workers uh, in Malaysia as, um, that did not have um, this. Uh, they did not did not have this uh, social insurance. They did not. They were not covered as a proportion of the the total number of of migrant workers in that country. So that's why we we got this um, these figures. Next slide, please. Now to, to sum up the correlates of not having access to social protection based on the components that we have discovered. So uh, it's more prevalent among women. So these are the characters of those without social protection. It's more prevalent among women. It's um, it's prevalent among the less educated, um, and it's more prevalent among those directly hired by employers. When you compare it with those that were hired through recruitment agencies, also it's more likely among those who did not need visa and those who used tourist visa visa when compared to those with. Um, work visa um, upon entry. Also, um, not having social protection is more prevalent among those without written contract than those with written contract. As you can see here, lucky non difference, 53% uh, versus 20%. Next slide, please. It's also more likely among workers um, in private households uh, when compared to uh, those uh, working in private establishments, so 32% uh, compared to 18%. Also, uh, international migrants working in skilled agricultural, forestry, and fishery works um, are less likely to be to be insured. Uh, and second, are those working in elementary occupations? I think if we look at the proportions at Ilumalabas, but if you if you look at the numbers. Um, you, if you consider uh, that we have an, a big number of workers uh, in elementary occupations, you would really say that oh, it's 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 more this group um, that we, we need to protect. Also, um, international migrants belonging to poorer households are less likely to have um, protection, and households living in uh, rural areas are less likely to to have social protection also. Among the top um, destination countries of migrant workers, the following countries have the highest um, percentage of those without social protection. So um, in terms of health insurance, that's Malaysia, Bahrain, Lebanon, South Korea, Kuwait. And then for uh, for social protection, and that includes health and pension, it's Malaysia, Lebanon, Bahrain, Kuwait, Singapore. It's important not to, to have this information, although hindi naman talaga um, kumbaga formally tested in a formal like regression analysis like that. Um, but for purposes of, for instance, of targeting um, uh, targeting uh, beneficiaries or or saan mo uh, mas intensify yung yung uh, kumbaga promotions or yung programs on increasing awareness. Um, so, so that's why we have looked into this, this um, key uh, destinations and we've shown them here so that, for instance, our outposts in those areas can, you know, arang, um, devise uh, better programs, more effective programs for, for improving, uh, promoting access to social protection. So let me just uh, zoom into Malaysia, for instance, uh, to check the profile of workers going there. An overwhelming majority of these uh, of the workers in this group, meaning those without any social uh, protection, uh, based on the components that we have that we have seen, um, were they were less educated and they held elementary occupations. And this is also the case for Singapore. In fact, for Singapore, seven in ten of those workers in this situation held elementary occupations so um, perhaps more concrete interventions um, can target you know those going to these countries next slide please so for our recommendations um, we'd, we'd really appreciate um, insights from of course from our colleagues in the government about um, 
how to to improve the the part the recommendations part uh, um we would we would really um welcome uh, insights but for now um i think it's it's important that we look at um education uh, awareness raising um programs and um education campaigns so uh, based on the first international movement of OFWs, we have seen that Filipino migrant workers were mostly young and educated, um, many with young children, and therefore their priorities uh, may be towards investing in their children rather than investing in their own protection. In fact, there is a literature that, that shows um, OFW investment in their children is their way to prepare for old age. So I think prioritizing you know, awareness, raising and, educa and education of our current and prospective migrants workers, migrant workers on the importance of social protection and being covered by our public insurance systems is, is an important step. You know, in investing in their protection also benefits their children and their families indirectly, you know, because this will lessen um, uh, the uh, you know um, for lack of better term burden you know on their, their on their children in the future in the future also um there is a great and urgent need to improve on financial literacy you know to increase the willingness and commitment of migrant workers to regularly contribute to insurance schemes for their protections and uh, to invest in their health to save more perhaps and invest in things that can help them mitigate the effects of of the of crises whatever whatever uh, will be the crisis in the future. For various efforts of expanding social protection access, the groups that must be prioritized are the less educated migrant workers, the women, those who hold elementary occupations, as these groups are less likely to have access to social protection. Next slide, please. Apart from education campaigns, um, there is a great need to intensify our promotion in terms of memberships in various insurance schemes and other social protection components. For this, I think we we need to um, work hard work harder in terms of simplifying our processes like like enrollment and payment. Um, I have uh, a, a person here with with first hand information. So my husband is a, is a, a former RFW and um, um, one of his uh, one of his constraints of of course also is the this this enrollment and this payment um, uh, while while he was uh, working abroad. So I think. Um, this is also the the issue uh, for, for for some people still, despite the the advancement that we've had in in the internet uh, and in payment systems. Uh, also, there is a need uh, perhaps to conduct assessment of the current mechanisms being utilized in securing the overseas employment certificate with respect to its um, ability or maybe inability to promote access to social insurance. No, so. These online platforms for OEC processing may have resulted to a more efficient process of securing the document, um, and that, that's really very helpful. But I think it may have um, reduced the opportunity for enrolling, you know, FWs in, in social protection schemes. Kasi di mo na kailangan dumaan dun sa sa na kailangan mong mag maging SSS, mag magkar ng SSS or feel health. Um, so I, I think we should look into this and see how we can. Turn, turn things around. And apart from the groups that we can target that I have um, mentioned earlier, uh, as I've said, our outposts in destinations with the highest percentage of those without social protection can perhaps include in their programs, you know, the promotion of, of social protection. So we mentioned Malaysia, Lebanon, Bahrain, Kuwait, Singapore, I think to, to some extent Hong Kong then. Um, since, um, and also since we've seen that those who use tourist visa and those who did not need visa in their entry, like um, those moving around Southeast Asia, kasi natin kailangan ng, <laughs> ng visa, um, they are more likely to, to not have social protection also. And, and the destinations where, yeah, where this is prevalent, as I've mentioned, are yeah, the, the Malaysia again. So at the yung natin kailangan kasi ng visa eh. And people go there uh, Using tourist visa, so United Arab Emirates actually an laki ng, ng percentages. Again, Malaysia, Singapore, and Hong Kong. So efforts for promoting social protection in this these host economies must be developed, um, if not intensified further, if there are already um, existing programs. So I think these these are the initial recommendations that we have so far, and we look forward to to the insights from our colleagues and of course from our from the public um, through the Q and A. Thank you very much.